you know, focus on why does bloodless care result in better outcomes, even in emergencies. I'm going to do a, a, a perhaps a deep dive, um, a deep dive into some biochemistry that might ang produce anxiety in some people. But to really tell you why your own blood is better and why staying with uh, what the patient has and, you know, treating that anemia, uh, as Kelly said, you know, giving somebody iron or EPO or something else is so much better than uh, just pulling the simple trigger of, uh, of, of calling a blood bank for a couple of units of blood. So we'll go into that. These are some of my disclosures. Um, some of them have to do, they certainly have to do with shaping my thinking about this. Um, so we're going to talk about mechanisms, mechanisms of particularly why blood from the blood bank and particularly red cells from the blood bank is not as good as any of my own red cells and why it actually makes my own red cells and my own um, endothelial cell function and my own inflammation uh, really uh, become further dysregulated. And, you know, the idea of giving a unit or two or three, um, I thought in Kelly's talk, she was going to tell us that that patient actually ended up dying because of those red cell transfusions, which could have been an outcome. Um, but <clears throat> um, why just giving those units of red blood cells um, actually disturbs the whole body and makes things worse rather than making them better. And I think it, I think it profoundly um, focuses our thinking that we've got tunnel vision, we've got incredible tunnel vision on a lab medicine value. And that lab medicine value is the hemoglobin value. And she, you know, Kelly talked about 3.8 grams per deciliter. Um, and, and, that, and that triggered a whole series of behaviors that nobody took a look at the entire patient. The entire patient was not struggling. The entire patient was not short of breath, dysmic, hypotensive, uh, high lactic acid going to die. The patient was just fine. She just had the unfortunate dysfunction of having an abnormal laboratory value. And for that, she suffered the physician's behavioral response, which um, ought to be examined um, itself. So there's no question or doubt that reducing allogeneic blood improves outcome. Yet, I would put you that 90% plus of your colleagues still can't wrap their heads around that. And we can talk about why that is. But what does the future hold, <clears throat> hold that should be hold, not hold, in terms of implementation and developing patient blood manless, bloodless medicine to become the standard for the care worldwide? And it is tough. This group that's listening today knows we're pushing rocks uphill. Um, I have taken five years at the University of Florida and just now have them interested in creating full-on business plans um, to make it go in the right direction. So let me talk about one of the major um, impediments we have, and that is the standard argument that comes back against us that why are there no randomized clinical trials that show that this is better? Um, and it really has to do with, a, again, a, um, a misinformation or a belief system that the only way that you can prove anything is from a randomized clinical trial. I have a number of uh, biostatisticians that work with me, and one of them does a profound job of showing why randomized clinical trials aren't useless, but that they aren't the gold standard that all of us believe. Greater than 85% of the randomized clinical trials that have been attempted to be reproduced cannot be reproduced. So if we accept that a randomized clinical trial has to be done for something um, to, be a, um, to be held as a truism in medicine, I think we're worshiping a false god right there. So we need to change that up. And the, you know, the Bradford Hill criteria that originally uh, came around um, will accept as therefore truthful that if a number of, of level two pieces of evidence support the same um, conclusion and most or the vast majority of that goes in the same direction, um, then you can uh, easily accept a cause and effect. And then there's other examples, and we say this in bloodless medicine all the time, but you know, did anybody ever do a randomized controlled trial on smoking causes cancer or emphysema? 
How about, you know, the other one that I love is, has anybody done a randomized control trial of whether parachutes save lives? Try jumping out of plane without one of those. So there's a belief system and what has come around in terms of blood transfusion is completely a belief system. Same with the Heimlich maneuver, never been a randomized control trial on that. So <clears throat> um, causation and transfusion and outcomes are convoluted. And if you look back through the history of how we actually have developed this uh, belief system, um, it's, it's fraught with human error. And, you know, Kelly brought it up very clearly that, you know, as an intern, you're allowed to transfuse. Who teaches you how to transfuse? The last gray haired old man or the, or the either, either the last gray haired old man who's on the um, service who says, you know, I want, I want all my patients transfused at this level of hemoglobin. There's nobody and there's still, to my knowledge today, and I just challenged our new dean of our medical school, I just challenged our new dean of our medical school to say, we don't teach um, either bloodless medicine, patient blood management, nor do we teach the transfusion decision correctly in any medical school in the United States. Let's teach it correctly. So I'm gonna talk about <clears throat> um, what are some of the mechanisms and what are some of the things that we, who truly believe in and embrace uh, patient blood management and bloodless medicine, we need to know why it is that we think your own red cells are so much better than um, receiving somebody else's or from, um, or from those from the blood bank. Now, <clears throat> I will put it to you, you know, that the world, at least the Western, uh, you know, at least the United States and Western Europe, have really forgotten about the um, problems of infectious disease. They think infectious disease from blood transfusion is no longer a problem. I just gave a lecture last week talking about infectious disease potential from the blood in COVID. And COVID has been found in the blood supply in China and in Japan and in Korea, and at least in Korea, there's one patient that is now reported to have contracted COVID from the, from the blood supply. And so do we know that that virus can't be transmitted? We have elected to ignore it in this country, and I suspect worldwide um, there may be a problem, but every blood banker, whoever gives a lecture about blood transfusion, the first thing they say is, don't forget that viruses are emerging all over the world all the time. So I don't wish to disregard that, but I wish to get down into some of the biochemistry and some of the other um, perhaps um, more complex issues um, that can have long-term effects on patients once that blood is infused. So there's no doubt that there's an increased length of stay, ICU length of stay, hospital stay, increased mortality. Yeah, absolutely. There's an increased mortality if you are transfused with allogeneic blood. Increased infection rate. We do everything in our hospital to try to decrease hospital acquired infection, except for one thing, and that's teach patient blood management and bloodless medicine. Um, when I was recruited to the University of Florida, I requested to talk to the hospital epidemiologist and I stared her right in the face and I said, if we do what I ask you to do, I will cut your hospital acquired infection rate dramatically. She said, what are you talking about? And I said, by decreasing transfusion, we will decrease your hospital acquired infection. She did nothing about it. Charlie Taco, renal failure, MI, long-term immunosuppression and cancer development and cancer recurrence are truly a big problem for um, perioperative and not just perioperative, but all um, transfusion medicine. So how, why is it that we can't have a randomized control trial? I said, there's no randomized control trial of transfusion versus not transfusion. There are lots of, and there are more and more of them all the time. These randomized control trials of a more liberal transfusion um, versus a more conservative transfusion trigger. And that's just designing two studies the wrong way and saying that somehow they're useful. Those two studies are taking a imperfect therapy, transfusion, 
and comparing it when we use a imperfect trigger point for that therapy. In other words, a lab medicine value, which is a surrogate marker of oxygen carrying capacity. It is not even a surrogate mark marker of oxygen delivery to tissues. And using that surrogate poor marker to say, give more blood here, give less blood there. But even out of those, the meta-analyses of those studies do show that there's a difference and that those patients given less blood do better. But nobody's ever done the, the, what I would consider to be the perfect study, which actually can be done if we, had, <clears throat> if we had the courage to do it. And that's to take a defined group of, um, of, of some type of surgery. And I proposed it here at University of Florida to take cystectomy patients, those patients who have um, cancer, bladder cancer, and randomize them to getting the best patient blood management standard we can provide versus otherwise routine therapy. And uh, I, I suspect we would quickly find out that um, those patients getting the best patient blood management, and I would suspect that 80 to 90% of them could get through the case <clears throat> with no, blood, with no uh, blood transfusion, but yet be at equipoise. In other words, yet have similar red cell masses and similar lab values as those patients who were transfused, if we employed every technique that we possibly can. And <clears throat> so, Yes, and here's, yes, you can show all of these things make a big difference and they add up. And these are some of the meta-analyses. This is one that was recently done, I think in 2017 or something, 235,779 surgical patients. Wow, 108,000 in a PBM group, 134,000 in the non-PBM group. <clears throat> and, and lo and behold, all of those outcomes were different that I just talked about. Yet, people still argue about this. And I, I just presented um, a proposal to our hospital administration to say, hey, you know, we've got to do this. And yet, I had one orthopedic surgeon who said, you're going to have a hard time convincing people that that's the right thing to do. I'm like, you know, how, how, can, you, how can you argue with, with people who are unwilling to um, experience that level of truth. And here's more from Colleen Cook. She happens to be our new Dean of our School of Medicine, which gives me great um, dance in my step to know that somebody who's um, written all these kinds of articles is now willing to accept and perhaps make our medical school the first in the world to actually teach full on patient blood management. Um, I mean, maybe, University of Calabar does it, um, but to try to get a big one in the United States to do it. And here's one of my favorites um, out of cardiac surgery <clears throat> um, that showed that each unit of blood, each unit of red blood cells increased mortality 16%. What in cardiac surgery increases mortality 16%? Yet, I can't convince um, surgeons around the world to say, well, we can do this bloodlessly all the time, or we have to do it with the same um, level of, of non-bias. Now, <clears throat> um, you know, Kelly talked about implicit bias and implicit bias. Yeah, I, I, I laud her for talking about that in the emergency room setting, but there's an implicit bias amongst all physicians when it comes to approaching these patients who say, they do it um, without, um, without blood if you would. And <clears throat> um, anyway, so we all know anemia is bad, but transfusion is actually worse and the two are highly interrelated. Um, and why is that? Well, there's clear immunomodulation. We'll talk about some of the reasons for that. And there's clear <clears throat> um, effects on cancer. Here's one from colorectal cancer that uh, shows a profound difference. Um, and those 16.8-fold <clears throat> uh, difference um, and, 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 and a pneumonia um, and then surgical site infection, sepsis, um, 
And so, you know, is it the cancer or is it all these other things that makes the difference? And it goes on and on and on. And then people talk about millions of blood transfusions, There's about 158 million transfusions given worldwide, but probably of which 70 to 80% of them were unnecessary. But, you know, who's defining necessary? And I, I told you, I just did three of the most complicated, biggest kinds of, of surgical cases, certainly in tertiary care, Western medicine, and I did them without blood. So um, we can do that. We absolutely can do that. So um, Neil Blomberg, very good friend of mine, um, blood banker has actually said more patients have died in one year owing to transfusion immunomodulation side effects than died in the entire transfusion transmitted AIDS epidemic. So once again, what are we gonna focus on? We need, we need to embrace it and focus on the right things. And then there's this funny guy down here in Florida who says that this is actually a silent epidemic. Is silent because everybody wants to turn their head and look in the other direction and is unwilling to embrace exactly what we're talking about today. And Rob Califf, who used to be the, the vice provost for research at, at, um, at Duke, who actually was the director of the US FDA for uh, about four years, has said that uh, blood transfusion is the third largest killer in the United States. It has just been superseded by COVID but I think it's probably still related. So most people don't really, if you ask them, and I challenge my, I challenge people in our operating rooms all the time. Yeah, I can make a lot of enemies real quickly by challenging somebody and say, why are you doing that? Just give me three reasons why you're doing that. And they'll give me a lot of gibberish and jargon and, and very often, unfortunately with resonance, it's because they say, well, my attending told me to do it. Okay, well, that's not really good science, is it? So the one thing that they often say is, well, I wanna give a unit of red cell because I wanna increase oxygen carrying capacity. Okay, that's fine, um, but does that help? And oxygen carrying capacity is a calculated number from, a, from perhaps a equation that really doesn't make much difference in an equation that certainly doesn't influence patient outcome, but everybody worships that one equation. Does it increase oxygen delivery? Probably not very much. And very often we've been able to demonstrate in animal models and research models that it makes oxygen delivery worse most often. And, um, the only place it's been shown to increase oxygen delivery is when patients have been below critical oxygen delivery level to begin with. And the patient that Kelly uh, enunciated was getting close to that critical oxygen delivery level of 2.5 to 3.5 grams per deciliter. But <clears throat> we hit a trigger. That's really bad medicine. Why do you use a laboratory value which in a patient who's not otherwise healthy and doing fine, and we see it all the time in the cardiac ICU, that so, somebody's sitting upright eating breakfast and the morning lab values come back and um, an intern orders two units of blood because the patient was at some trigger level that he's been told by somebody to treat. And we treat anemia. Um, and we treat anemia because we believe anemia is bad. Anemia is bad, but transfusion is worse. And the connection between those two things is a physician's mind and a physician's misbehavior. So if I'm treating some physiologic problem, that could be important. But what's the physiologic problem? And most often, the physicians who I challenge really don't know why they're doing what they're doing, but they're doing it anyway. So <clears throat> here's, some of the, here's some of the work that's come out that shows that um, if you transfuse, you actually don't improve it. And here's one study um, recently, 2017, up to three units of blood that didn't increase oxygen delivery and oxygen extraction ratios and utilization by tissues in, hum in a human being. So <clears throat> it, it, if it doesn't increase that, then what are you doing it for? Um, just to make yourself look better on a lab value. That's all it is. And it goes on. These are other ones that show that 
um, by giving a transfusion, you are not improving the physiologic effort of what you're trying to do, which is to increase oxygen getting to the tissues in need. The patient's own blood does that just fine. By you giving blood, you actually very often will make it worse, not better. So the, the reason it gets worse, and that's where I wanna take some of the deeper dive into things, is that <clears throat> halogenic blood can be damaging, not life-saving, and we don't know which one it is. And we're, we're rolling that, those dice in a crapshoot to just see what's gonna happen. And we're doing it um, just because somebody told us that that's the right way to do it. And that's, that's not based on science. So stored RBCs <clears throat> clog the microcirculation. Um, my microcirculation is not as good as some of you younger folks um, that are listening. As I age, my number of capillaries that can open and can function decrease. At, I'm, I'm, <clears throat> um, I'm in my mid to late 60s. My brain capillary density per tissue, per gram of tissue is probably about half of what it was when I was 18. But here's the thing, no matter what my, my ultimate capability of, uh, of capillary density is, um, the, at any one moment, uh, only about a third of my capillaries are open. And the, the, the reason somebody who's a, who's a world-class athlete can be a world-class athlete is because they can open all those capillaries. And maybe they have more capillaries per tissue than do I. But if I give you red blood cells from the blood bank, I'm clogging up many of those capillaries. And stored blood immunosuppresses the body both short-term and long-term. So as soon as I give you someone else's blood, and it's not just because <clears throat> of HLA antibodies, um, which might cause, which might have a influence upon trolley, but it's, it's for a whole host of reasons, some of which are, um, we're going to talk about here. So bank blood feeds the inflammasome and, and depresses the inflammasome. So it overwhelms the inflammasome. Well, what's the inflammasome? Those are platelets and white cells and the things that are supposed to scavenge external um, invaders of our body. So if you overwhelm the body's own natural army that's standing by, um, you're gonna make things bad, bad and worse. And blood coagulation products do not restore homeostasis in dysregulating blood bleeding patients. There's actually data that shows that those patients given FFP bleed more than those who, who don't. And um, there's you know, a question of why. This is one slide off the internet. You can find thousands of these. And as we put blood into the uh, blood bank and we cool it and we make it acidotic um, and it ages, the, the red blood cells get more and more dysfunctional and they become schistocytes, echinocytes, um, and all kinds of sites that just um, don't behave normally. And I'm gonna talk about the biochemistry of why that is. But the end point of this is that those red blood cells that are normal, that look like little donuts, um, have evolved that way for, for billions of years and for many um, morphologic reasons. And a morphologic reason that they are better that way is that that discoid shape can fold and it can elongate and it can maintain the distance from cellular surface to center of the cell and hemoglobin to be universally the same throughout the entire cell structure. So, and during the time that the cell then changes shape, it still maintains um, the movement of oxygen off the hemoglobin. <clears throat> so I also believe that um, older blood is worse than fresher blood. And at least in, in this country, trying to get fresh, warm, whole blood from a blood bank is almost nearly impossible. It, it might be possible in some centers and some places. Um, but biology makes a huge difference. Now, here's, here's again, the bias that creeps in is there have been some studies that are touted to be very large 
with randomized controlled trials of older blood versus fresher blood. One of them had 32,000 patients in it, but they talked about no difference in mortality. So if the difference in, if, if the mortality from a unit of blood um, by the blood banker's definition is say one in a hundred thousand and you only did 32,000 patients, it is completely statistically impossible to find a difference with older versus fresher blood, but yet they've taken that and proposed it uh, all the way around, including to the FDA, that now they've proved that older blood is as good as fresher blood. It just is a widely flawed, biased um, inability to understand the biology and translate the biology to doing the correct studies. But red blood cell storage lesions, <clears throat> um, um, you know, change the pH, change the ATP, the 2,3-DPG, lactic acid goes up as you store blood older and older, um, these things get worse and worse. And how can that be a life-saving material? Well, part of the problem is that at, as they age, they also release free hemoglobin. So if you study the free hemoglobin in fresh versus old blood, particularly in sepsis, this study was done in sepsis, you find that <clears throat> free hemoglobin immediately after the transfusion um, goes up dramatically in old blood um, versus fresh blood. But it gets even worse if you study it several days after that. And um, there's a lot of free hemoglobin in a unit of stored blood, but there's a whole lot more free hemoglobin in the patients after you transfuse them 48 to 72 hours later, because the red cells that you, trans the red cells that you transfuse um, break down, fall apart, and about 50%, by day three, about 50%. And this is not in somebody who has an immune system reaction to the blood that you're transfusing. This is just standard that by day three, about 50% of the blood that's been transfused is now broken down and free hemoglobin has been released because the red cells that you're transfusing are fragile. And so they break and they release all of their intracellular contents and they don't really help you out. Now I'm gonna show you a YouTube video and you can go and find these YouTube videos. There's probably 50 or hundred of them out there on YouTube. I'm gonna shut off the sound for just a second so everybody can watch it. And if, if all of medicine watched this in medical school before they started out on their wards, they might transfuse um, somebody a little bit differently if they would just watch and, and think this through. So I could play that over and over again for you and you would see just what and it would work into your brain of just, what does that do? And if, and if you're somebody my age or older, who's already lost a third to half of their potential capillaries and now, the, and now you're giving units of blood. So who do we transfuse? We don't, I mean, once in a while, sure we transfuse um, uh, neonates and stuff, but who do we transfuse? We transfuse the, the older, sicker age group patients who may already have both inflammation and capillary density problems. So let's talk about 2,3-diphosphoglycerate. Most of us don't, you know, we, we, we can speak the language, but do we really understand what it does and how it does this allosteric shifting of hemoglobin to let oxygen come on and off the hemoglobin? So 2,3-biphosphor or diphosphoglycerate <clears throat> is manufactured in the red cells as a side product of um, anaerobic glycolysis. Let me say that again, anaerobic glycolysis. The red blood cell is completely anaerobic. It is surrounded and contains the highest concentration of oxygen in any part of our body but the cellular mechanism inside the red cell that makes ATP is pure anaerobiosis. And it cannot, and a matter of fact, it will be, <clears throat> it will be made worse if you try to 
force that particular Krebs cell cycle to function by oxygen. It doesn't work. So 2,3-diphosphoglycerate is manufactured inside the red cell and it is there um, to both unload um, oxygen off the red cell for us and it has to be in the right concentration to change that unloading, that allosteric um, modification of the red cell to let the, let, the, um, let the oxygen come off. Now oxygen binds to hemoglobin 5,000 to 100,000 times tighter than it comes off. So, so hemoglobin is actually an evolutionary product in our bodies to keep our cells from having too much oxygen. Once again, we don't teach that correctly. And 2,3-DPG has a enzyme that changes and it, it changes its oxidative state. 2,3-DPG mutase. And 2,3-DPG mutase is handled by other enzymes that keep both hemoglobin and the 2,3-DPG mutase enzyme from becoming oxidized. So how does the cell keep the production going of 2,3-DPG? Well, it's ATP dependent and it's ATB ATP dependent through this cascade of enzymes. And this cascade of enzymes is evolved to handle extra electrons and to scavenge electrons. So scavenging electrons has to do with oxidative stress. Oxidative stress leads to breakdown of both enzymes and lipids. And so this particular uh, uh, glutathione reductase and um, is dependent in the red cells completely on ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid is the ultimate, vitamin C is the ultimate electron uh, donor and receptor in our bodies and um, the, the controller of extra electrons. Now here's the key to all of patient blood management perhaps, or at least blood banking, is that as soon as we put red blood cells into the blood bank, we take them away from plasma, right? We shunt the plasma away. Where does ascorbic acid come from? It comes from the plasma. And as soon as we take the plasma away, there's no more vitamin C, and the vitamin C inside controlling the glutathione reaction, and a 2,3-DPG is exhausted within two, two to four days. And so, <clears throat> um, but what have blood bankers tried to do around the world is to increase the oxygen content inside the red blood cell, thinking that if we can get those blood bags to just transport some more oxygen across the blood bag, we'll preserve the blood better. But that's functionally wrong because the red blood cell is anaerobic. And I don't care how much oxygen you have on your hemoglobin, you will have no effect on 2,3-DPG because the ATP production of 2,3-DPG is dependent upon um, glucose and other stores and having functional, continuous, functional vitamin C. So some people have tried to put <clears throat> vitamin C into bank blood to see if that improves and, and, and makes things better and we can store blood longer and we can get more glutathione in, the, in, those, in those blood bags. And you can for about 12 to 24 hours, but you need constant infusion of vitamin C. And nobody's thought it through that way to say, well, can I, can I continuously bathe the cell and increase storage um, function by doing that? And so the, the, the fact that these cells lose glutathione and lose the glutathione reductase and lose the ability to handle oxidative stress means that the red cells become oxidized. The hemoglobin inside becomes oxidized and the whole red cell becomes oxidized. And so what happens when you oxidize a lipid? It doesn't work normally. And oxidized lipids are profoundly inflammatory and oxidized lipids break down and they break apart from cell surfaces and you get microparticles. 
and microparticles of oxidized lipids overwhelm the inflammasome and make it so that both the red cells flexibility decreases, the red cells <clears throat> ability to function normally decreases and unbound hemoglobin becomes toxic and unbound hemoglobin is profoundly toxic and unbound hemoglobin um, is a vasoconstrictor um, and it goes on and on and on. And it's a profound, um, it's a prof has profound effects upon renal function and so many other cells in our body. So, um, <clears throat> and it changes blood pressures in the lungs. And so you can try to nitrosylate it. Well, NO is as good as a vasodilator, but it doesn't get to the basic problem, which is the cell is already oxidized. So what is NO? NO is a profound oxidative agent and it's held on hemoglobin, but it's held on hemoglobin correctly and normal hemoglobin inside your own red cells circulating in your body right now. And it's in a homeostatic level. And so it's produced, it's, it's contracted onto the hemoglobin and it's released. So just binding more NO onto blood in a blood bank doesn't solve the problem. And people have tried the same thing with blood substitutes. It doesn't solve the problem. You need to understand, you absolutely need to understand the biochemistry. So once the um, glutathione is poisoned and you have lack of vitamin C because we've taken plasma away from it and we're no longer supplying blood circulating in a normal situation in the body and we put it in the blood bank, these pieces of membrane come off and those pieces of membrane, as I said, are extremely pro-inflammatory. They influence thrombin production. They generate fibrinol fibrinolysis um, and they make platelets dysfunction and they ultimately lead to profound immunosuppression. And so other people have shown <clears throat> that they, that both those microparticles and hemoglobin um, create hypertension, vascular injury, renal dysfunction, and on and on and on it goes. So, so um, and this is again going at the function of the oxidization of the red blood cells in routine storage and that severely oxidized um, red blood cells because of diphosphoglycerate binding and nitric oxide homeostasis has all dysfunction that these things um, lead to uh, a number of amino acid residues and other, and other contributions that eventually make the red blood cell fracture, break down and free the hemoglobin. So free hemoglobin and free iron is actually a trigger for apoptosis. And so if you're in the kidney, or you're an endothelial cell and you're bombarded with free iron or with free hemoglobin, it triggers the actual, it actually triggers the DNA that signals to the cell, it's time for me to die. It is a suicide molecule. So by us giving banked blood, we're essentially triggering these DNA productions throughout the body to say, it's time for me to go and die. This is not a life-saving therapy. Extracellular potassium rises. It rises because the cells leak. It rises because the cells leak because of oxidative stress. It rises because the oxidative stress plays on one particular protein I'm gonna show you in a minute. And that particular one protein, band three protein, is just now being understood. And that band three protein is the one that really controls sodium, potassium, calcium fluxes across cell membranes. And when that is oxidized, it dysfunctions. And yeah, we see a rash of deaths in pediatrics and neonates when we give them bank blood because the potassium is so high. And so now people are saying, well, really what we need to do is not just not transfuse these kids, Really what we need to do is wash the red cells. Okay, but you still haven't understood the problem to begin with. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, I'm gonna move forward here. This, this is what um, this ferroptosis, this iron, 
is, uh, as I've said, free iron um, is, is actually such a trigger for cell apoptosis and so ferroptosis is the triggering agent that leads to systemic apoptosis. And especially if you are in an area of the body wherein the lodged red blood cells are breaking down and especially in the body, if you're somebody who is lacking ferritin, hepcidin and the other hemoglobin binding molecules that have the ability to scavenge these things. And who has those uh, lack of those um, lack of those particular proteins? It's patients who are critically ill. So, and who do we transfuse? Patients who are critically ill. So as I said, they're trying to make the, por the bags more porous to let more oxygen in. A basic misunderstanding, a basic bias of, of, of almost kindergarten physiology of oxygen is good, hypoxia bad. No, in this case, hypoxia is good for red cells. And there's a group in Cambridge, Massachusetts that's actually trying to preserve red cells better by making them hypoxic and by supplying antioxidants to the cells as they preserve them. So um, let me just turn also to cytokines. We're, you know, this lecture I just gave recently about COVID and the blood um, is very important because now we are all focused on the cytokine storm. Well, the cytokine storm comes from white cells, from T cells being massively uh, activated um, during the COVID infection. And it, it, are, are the cytokines a marker or are they a cause of disaster? They're both, they're both markers and causes. And <clears throat> IL-10, IL-6, uh, TNF-alpha all have profound effects upon um, coagulation and upon other cells. But older blood preserved with CPDA1 um, can show profound levels of the cytokines. Okay, this work was done back in 1996, and it was done before most of the blood, at least in uh, North America and Europe, is white cell reduced. And nobody's looked yet um, with similar kind of work to show what the cytokine levels are in white cell reduced blood. But I'll put it to you that I suspect most of the world that transfuses does not use white cell reduction universally. And so um, cytokine production and cytokine infusion is uh, dramatic. Cytokines, a cytokine storm, and we've all, each one of us has experienced a cytokine storm. If you've ever had influenza, you've experienced cytokine storm. If you survived COVID, you have, you have survived it in one shape or another. And that's, that's roughly a 35 fold increase in cytokines. The amount of cytokines in a, in a unit of bag blood is a hundred fold normal. And in a unit of platelets is a thousand fold normal. And that's supposed to be a life-saving, uh, life-giving force. And so these things contribute to immunosuppression. I said the um, microparticles do. Yeah, um, immunoglobulins, uh, HLA antigens, antibodies, uh, um, affect the immune system, but so also do these cytokines profoundly downregulate them. And <clears throat> you can find, um, if, if you take a few drops of plasma from a unit of, of banked blood and you put it with white cells from a recipient in tissue culture and then introduce into that tissue culture E. coli, the white cells will not optimize the E. coli. They are paralyzed. They will not touch the E. coli. They um, ignore it. And it is the supernatant from the red blood cell uh, plasma that's still in that bag that profoundly immunosuppresses. And here is, here's a picture's worth a thousand words. This is a red cell <clears throat> that I think is uh, 35 days old or something. And you can see these little microparticles that it's budding off. It's budding those microparticles because it is a cell under profound internal oxidative stress. And that profound internal oxidative stress is making its red cell membrane unstable. And it's breaking that red cell membrane off into little tiny particles. And these microparticles are highly active um, uh, 
phosphatidylserine, phosphatidylcholine that has been oxidized. And oxidized phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylserine get into the immune system and paralyze the immune system. And <clears throat> also, if you get any of my white cells, my white cells will live in you for the rest of your life. And so it's been widely demonstrated that persons who are transfused are now um, at least about, we can show 15 to 20% of those patients transfused are now um, chimeras of other people's DNA. And that lives in them for, for, um, for very long periods of time. These are veterans of World War uh, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, those who were transfused, that pr proportion of them that we could then find multiple different human beings' DNA with inside. Scary stuff, right? And now the blood bankers say, well, because we, we white cell reduce, this isn't so bad. Yes, but it probably still happens. So I'm going to get to the end here <clears throat> um, because I do want to be able to leave us time for questions. Um, but the AABB, American Association of Blood Bankers, says that old blood is as good as fresh blood. Well, now, wait a minute. I just told you we haven't, we haven't proven that. But just because we did 35,000 patients, um, and that looks like a lot of patients on a, uh, on a study, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't pass muster for um, design of the study or designing it correctly. Biology says there are huge differences. I just told you the biology. So biology is all in our favor in terms of don't give blood. Utilize a patient's own blood. Utilize every resource you have to keep them from needing somebody else's blood. But there are people that are starting now to try to put vitamin C. And here's the thing, vitamin C isn't sexy. It's not the, uh, it's not a $10,000 drug remdesivir to cure COVID. It's, it's vitamin C, but vitamin C is absolutely basic to the whole glutathione situation. But you gotta put the right amount in at the right time and keep it circulating and let the metabolism do what it's supposed to do. And that so far, nobody's been able to do um, whatsoever. And it does make a modest difference in red cell morphology at least if you look at it a day or two after it's been given. But if you're gonna keep the blood for 35 days and you're only given vitamin C once, um, it's exhausted in no time. So the biochemistry of these storage lesions is profound, it's exciting, it's interesting, but so far, um, it, again, there are biases working against it. So mother nature is biologic complexity and I'm just taking a bag of red blood cells and sticking them in the refrigerator doesn't make them normal. And you and I know that. Um, and let me get to this band three protein. This is the one last thing I wanna talk about. Band three protein is this transmembrane protein that controls <clears throat> um, sodium, potassium and other fluids. But the minute this, or the microsecond that this band three protein is uh, oxidized, it dysfunctions and red cell membranes um, are made extremely sticky. And the red cell membranes not only um, bud off those microparticles, but they become sticky and they stick to endothelial cells and they, they are, their clearance is enhanced in the microcirculation and you get more, more and more hemoglobin breakdown. So we've lost it in medicine. Um, red wine has, has um, resveratrol, phenols that are antioxidants. There's actually an editorial in the journal Transfusion about maybe we ought to, and this is tongue in cheek, maybe we ought to have patients or maybe we ought to have blood donors have a glass of red wine to get the resveratrols into their red cells before they donate. Well, that's tongue in cheek, but it misses the whole point that if you know that, then go solve the problem or at least work down that line instead of continuing to just worship getting more oxygen and more stuff into the blood. Um, we've talked about Jehovah's Witnesses. This is one of my favorite papers for, out, of, uh, out of Cleveland Clinic. Those patients, those patients who get less blood do better. There is absolutely no doubt about it. Same from Western Australia. 
Um, those patients who get less blood and it saves tons of money and it probably has a lot to do with all the biochemistry I've just talked about. Um, and um, even with all these papers being published, more and more papers are being published. The, the medicine is not beating our door down yet that this is the right way to do it. If you wanna see many of my thoughts boiled down, read this editorial. These are two patients, the two lowest hemoglobin uh, levels that I'm aware of anywhere in the world. I've taken three patients to below three grams per deciliter hemoglobin, they've all survived. Um, but here's one to 0.6 grams per deciliter hemoglobin. And I talk about many of these issues in there, um, but PBM's job appears to be never done. Um, and, you know, just like in politics in the United States, truth doesn't seem to matter anymore. But what we need to do is for all of us to not give up, keep pushing that car under the hot sun, the long distance, and we'll get there.